Thank you for coming this evening. I'm pleased to introduce Maria Smith from Studio Weave, um, and which is a London-based architecture practice. Established in 2006 by Maria and Jay Ahn, the practice is known for uncovering the embedded narratives of the sites on which they build, creating colorful, engaging, and tactile projects with an interest in craft and materiality. Both Maria and Jay studied architecture first at the University of Bath, then at TU Delft, and finally at London Met. From the lullaby factory of Great Ormond Street Hospital that creates a fairy tale soundscape in the space between buildings, to their Smith Pavilion that celebrated the local tradition of smithing or craft at Clerkenwell Design Week earlier this year, to their Allgate Timber Palace on stilts, paleys upon pilars, in tribute to Geoffrey Chaucer, um, to their colorful park pavilion in Dartford titled Ecology of Color. Each project draws on its context history to catalyze the area into action and make us experience these places in new and unexpected ways. <coughs> As the title of their lecture, Longest, Loudest, Scariest, Spiciest, suggests, Studio Weave never settles for the mediocre and pushes each project to be the somethingest of its kind. As I read on their website earlier today, Studio Weave is an awesome architecture practice working on awesome projects everywhere. So I think we can all now sit back and watch what promises to be an awesome lecture. Please join me in welcoming Maria Smith. So, yeah, that was kind of a joke um, <laughs> that went a bit wrong. Never mind. Um, OK, so um, hi. Thanks for having us. Um, we've done a bit of an experiment um, where we've tried to think of what the est of every project is. Um, we do try to make things the best version of themselves. We think it's really important that you don't just have some abstract idea of what a project should be and then plonk it onto a site that something has to grow from its context um, but in a, in a kind of twisted or extreme way usually um, finding some sort of eccentricity so things being the somethingest um, so I'm going to present a kind of whirlwind tour of Studio Weave projects um, and say what each somethingest is est. some of the words aren't exactly real words sorry so, first of all, the dreamiest. So this is the Lullaby Factory. Um, and this project, sorry, I've got a bubble in my throat. Ah, do I sound normal now? Yeah, it's better. OK, um, so this project um, is one of the most, um, one of the clearest examples of this best version of itself. In that this was the site that we were presented with at the beginning. Um, this is a building opposite a new clinical building, Children's Wards, for Great Ormond Street Hospital. And this building is half in use, half decommissioned. Um, it's only going to be there for another 15 years, but during that 15 years, these lovely new wards with huge windows are looking onto this instead of the um, garden that will be there in 15 years' time. So the brief was to try and improve this view, just make this less awful and depressing for children in hospital, for their brothers and sisters, for their parents who really, they don't need this. Um, but the problem is, is that a lot of these pipes are working. Um, one of the first questions we asked were which ones are working and which ones aren't. And the answer we got was it's not worth finding out. Um, so we had to work with this. We had to make this somehow better. And it's such, you can sort of see already from just this photo that it's quite sort of inny, outy, crinkly, and the site is actually longer than this and more awkward. Um, so to sort of tidy it up and cover it all up would really reduce the space even further. So instead, our approach was to try and make this mean something else. Make this the best version of what these ugly pipes could be. So rather than being able to take anything away, which we couldn't do, or cover it up, which would reduce the space, we had to more, add more stuff. So this was our proposal, and it was a competition at the beginning, which we eventually won. Um, and what we decided to do was imagine that all of these pipes are doing, rather than the boring things associated with buildings, um, doing the magical thing of making lullabies and delivering them to children who are trying to get to sleep. Um, and so we imagined what the processes would be involved in making a lullaby. What are the raw ingredients? How do you collect them? What kind of processes do you have to go through? What kind of innovative te technological solutions um, are required to make lullabies and deliver them to children? Um, and we invented this whole uh, kind of uh, factory blueprint um, and then designed all of these different systems and incorporated all of the existing pipes into this. 
Um, so then it was a very collaborative process working with AB3 Workshops, um, who are metal, fabrica metal fabricators um, based in East London. They're not working anymore, but they were brilliant. Um, and it was all about, we didn't have huge amounts of money, so it was all about using simple techniques, um, proprietary elements and things, the normal kind of stuff of plumbing, actually, to um, realise all of these crazy different um, different process elements and so on. And that involved making new items as well as adding little bits and wiggly things to existing items so that you could really co-opt all of the existing pipework into the eventual lullaby factory. So as you can see here in these images, some of these things are existing, some of them are proposed. It's not always obvious which is which. And that was really the, um, the aim to, by adding these new things, you make these existing things mean something different. So here are some of the crazier, more obviously added elements. Um, and we were really lucky in that during this period, um, an old boiler house in, in the um, building was being decommissioned. So we could go in and nick some of these dials and handles and so on um, and add them to the lullaby factory to give it an extra bit of authenticity. Um, and here you can see sort of, you know, this is new, but this is old. And because they're made of the same stuff, we're using those proprietary elements, not only does it save money, but also it helps to blend these two things together. We also worked with a composer to make a real lullaby um, and the lullaby can be heard on the hospital radio and also through these four listening pipes. Um, and there's me listening to them and feeling dreamy. So then next, how about the Agilest, um, Agilest project that we've done? So this was a collaboration with dancers um, and it's wonderful working with dancers because they take your structure and then they like bash it about and use it percussively and kind of do all kinds of crazy things with it. And I don't have loads of slides of this one, but essentially it was an aluminium frame that when put in one configuration created a house and when put in another configuration, this red, these red elements made a boat and they used it for various things and they moved it around and hung off it and did all kinds of stuff. And that was really fun. Driftiest project, okay? Well, we turn this into this. <laughs> and um, this was a uh, commission by the Olympic Delivery Authority in the year before the Olympics um, to do something, some kind of mobile um, engaging project that would move around the Olympic boroughs. Um, and we worked with Up Projects and somewhere to come up with this idea of creating a cinema in a narrowboat that could then travel the canals around the, um, around the Olympic boroughs. It's only a little 12 seat cinema, um, but it, it kind of, it, visited, it was visited by 5,000 people in that 12 seat cinema during a period of about three months, drifting along. The longest, okay, so this one's kind of easy because it's already called The Longest Bench. Um, this was a project that we did ages ago now. Um, it started in 2007, I think. No, 2006, and then we completed it in 2008 or something like that. Um, and. Um, it was started off just as an idea to create a really, really long bench. We had no funding. We didn't even exactly have a client. Um, it was a local entrepreneur that came to us and said, oh, I've got this idea to create a bench for people to eat their ice creams on along the seafront. And I want it to be really long. And then we thought, well, if it's going to be really long, then we should try and make it record breaking. And we tried to find out what is the longest bench in the UK so far. And um, the claim was that the, the bench that Tom Dixon had done in Trafalgar Square, which is only a temporary um, bench, it was a blue bench he did um, a few years ago and it was about 110 meters long or something. It's like, oh, we can beat that. What's the longest bench in the world then? Um, and we found one in Poland that was 601 meters long, um, but it was in a stadium and they'd put in these extra little bits over the um, corridors in. So we thought that was cheating, it's a bit rude. But anyway, we managed to make it to uh, 324 meters long, I think. Um, and we ended up um, working with the council. We worked with CABE, who um, through sea change funding gave us um, a large amount of money um, to build it, a large proportion of the budget. Um, we also um, got funding from the body shop, um, from Gordon Roddick, and there was a micro funding scheme as well. So to try and make it as long as possible, um, local businesses and individuals could pay 60 pounds to have their name or a message inscribed, including this um, marriage proposal. And a couple of times we've had a marriage proposal as a, on a project and I think it's, you know, awards are cool, but if somebody chooses your project to propose to someone, I think that's a pretty great accolade. Um, Solly is the dog, in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> Luckily, Andrew said yes, otherwise it would be a sad story. <laughs> um, it also incorporated these two shelters. Um, 
where the bench continues and it wiggles all around madly and there's two of those that really connect this green space. Unfortunately, it was a really hot summer and the grass is all pretty much dead there. Sorry, I'm about to sneeze. It'll come in a minute. Okay, fastest. What's the fastest one? I can't remember. Oh yeah, oh, this is fast. So eight weeks from the beginning of, um, from them calling us up and um, eight weeks later, we had made them this, um, made them this roof garden. We've done quite a lot of um, small and temporary projects. Um, I think we've got about 30 projects that we've done now since 2006, which is kind of loads, but it's because a lot of them have been quite small. And that means that you have to be sometimes very, very reactive and think very carefully about what kind of materials you are readily available, sort of no lead in time, just quick, get some paint, make it bright. Um, and yeah, this was um, the summer just gone, eight weeks only from um, them first calling us and it's just made of um, simple decking boards just cut in cut in half so you know they that use the existing module as get everything as efficient as possible um, just normal deck paint and just in tutti frutti colors to make it all toothpaste and nice craftiest so this is the smith pavilion uh, that was mentioned um, and it's not named after me <laughs> no, it is named after. It's not named after me. Um, so we were asked to do a pavilion for Clerkenwell Design Week, and Clerkenwell Design Week is great, but it can get a little bit producty, kind of end producty. And so we wanted to celebrate, to sort of complement this, we wanted to celebrate the processes that were also involved in making all of these things. So something where we can actually demonstrate the kinds of things that go on behind um, the final products. Um, and when we're looking into the history of Clerkenwell, there were loads and loads of um, different crafts that used to take place there. Um, so we worked with Equitone, um, who make this um, fibre cement panel, um, and we wanted to explore as much as possible what you could do with this material. Uh, it's normally just a cladding material, but can we use it structurally? Can we use it as a stress skin? Can we sort of inlay it to make these decorative patterns? Um, and we did, um, oh, this is how it was invented, Mr. Ludwig Hatchek. Um, and we did loads of different tests to figure out how we could use it um, that involved lots of fun and breaking of stuff um, and sort of figure out what's the best way, you know, what is the minimum distance that we can actually use because it's actually a wonderful material that you can almost use like plywood um, in terms of sort of the way that you can CNC it and so on but it's, it can be used outside, it's not going to delaminate, it's really, really tough um, so we had loads of fun making all of these inlays and these are all the different kind of smiths that used to exist in Clarkwell. So print smith, hat smith, beer smith, flute smith, silver smith, CNC smith, book smith, building smith, ink smith, tattoo smith, clock smith, coffee smith, glass smith, and shoe smith. Um, and there they are. This is also um, only around in Clarkwell for a very short period, but hopefully it's being reassembled in Belgium. Largest. So we haven't done too many very largest projects. Uh, this is the largest living room. <laughs> And that was what it would end up being called. This is actually a very early project as well. Um, it was in uh, 2008, I think. Um, and it was in Somerset House initially, creating a big living room where loads of people could just come and hang out. Um, working with Eli Kishimoto, who are brilliant print designers, um, who've done this really loud pink pattern. And we created all of this flat pack furniture. It's very, very simple. Um, that was all together to create this large living room for the first weekend of the London Architecture Festival. Um, and then it got transported all over London, so they were sort of all over, um, sort of from Covent Garden and sort of British Library, obviously, all over London, and then they got transported all over the world, and there's random pink benches in random places, maybe you'll see one randomly one day, send me a picture of it. Ah, lovingest. What have we got for this one? <laughs> ah, Freya and Robin, yes. So, um, we, um, we started working with narrative um, as a way to kind of develop briefs a little bit for ourselves um, because a lot of the projects that we did, especially in, in the early stages of the practice, didn't really have um, like a strict function. It's not like, oh, well, I need a classroom that's this big or a lab that does this or so on. Um, and these kind of public art projects that we were trying to sort of make some architecture happen from them. Um, and so when we, were, um, when we were shortlisted to design this pavilion up in Kielder, um, and the only purpose was really just somewhere that's nice to sit and have a sandwich and look at the view. We decided we wanted to explore the idea of how we could sort of find more meaning in it. Um, and this is a picture from the first site visit. And it's 
it's all completely fake. I mean, all of these trees have just been imported and planted in these massive hectares. This is the largest reservoir in Europe. It's completely man-made. They put fish in the water so that people can go fishing. Um, they have this policy of like the first like 500 meters or something around the water. You've got to make it look natural, but none of it's natural. It's a sort of it's a monoculture. It's it's mad. And so we thought, well, maybe we can work with that. Maybe we can say this is just a stage set. This is this is already a myth, a narrative, a fiction. So can we work with that? So we wrote a love story. Um, we chose rather than just one site. If we wanted to write a story, we wanted to sort of have two opposing characters. Um, we asked the client if we could have two sites, greedy, um, and wrote a love story personifying the two different characteristics of the site to invent these two characters, Freya and Robin. So Robin, that's him, um, is a kind of elf-like creature that lives in the woods, very simply. Um, and Freya is more of a kind of goddess who likes to collect flowers and sort of she lives on this kind of sweeping hillside on the sunny side of the um, on the sunny side of the reservoir and Freya sees Robin on the other side sort of she's basically falls for him and decides that she wants to build a cabin to entice him over onto her side of the um, reservoir so we worked with um, a local carpenter Gavin Tremble to make Robin's hut um, which is a very simple shingle um, building we just did some very simple sketches and really let Gavin um, sort of do it um, build it in the way that he felt was right and we let him become Robin and he, you know, he saw the story and everything. He, he really embraced that. Um, and then Freya's cabin is actually quite high-tech little um, structure. Um, it's all made in the kind of um, in the technology that Freya would know. So we imagine that she collected flowers and pressed them. Um, so it's made with like a flower press. We imagine that she balanced it up on tall flower stems so that in order that Robin would have the best chance of seeing it. So we, created these stems underneath it. Um, there's foxgloves in the back there to invite the fairies in. Um, and because it's all made of plywood, um, it absorbs a lot of water and then freezes, so it actually expands and contracts quite a lot. And there are these skis inside that allow for this expansion and contraction. There are springs inside the um, flower press to allow for that. Um, and the um, it's clad, this um, teku, uh, sorry, we use Nordic, Nordic gold in the end. Um, material has quite large slip joints um, and this is because when when Robin is um, does eventually build a boat and come over um, he actually starts rowing the other way and Freya is so distraught that she tears her, she cries these tears of gold which is what the Norse goddess Freya is known to do her namesake um, and so she wraps the cabin in these tears of gold um, and then the sun glints off the tears and Robin comes along and they all live happily ever after um, and these had to have these quite complicated slip joints and things. So something that was quite fairy tale and sort of fanciful ended up becoming quite high tech. And this is something that we took forward in our practice quite a lot and thinking about we have to, at the beginning, be very, very open minded and think that anything could be um, a possible solution. But then you have to get really serious and technical about how to achieve that, because if you can't like achieve your silly idea, then it's just a silly idea um, and you can't sort of share it. So that's something that became important about doing the somethingest. Trickiest. So well this leads on quite well um, thinking at first of reading loads of poetry that Chaucer wrote um, while he was living in the rooms above Olgate, which is where this is, um, and imagining what he might have been thinking. Um, he wrote these two poems, The Parliament of Fowls and, oh god I forgot the other one, Another very important choice, um, but there was this recurrent image of very decorative structures balancing very, very high on slender stems, um, and we just sort of could imagine him sitting up there in these rooms above the old gates. I think there's a picture of oh no, not yet. Uh, there's a picture of the old gate. Um, rooms above the old gate where he's working as a customs official, looking down at the madness of London. It's above Houndsditch, which is called that because it was full of dead dogs you know, just total carnage downstairs and then like a small precious little room. And there was this image that kept coming up in the poetry that he wrote while he was living there. So we were trying to imagine something like that. And you sort of, you do these early sketches and it's all kind of floaty and nice. Um, but then you're trying to build something in a scheduled ancient monument site on a traffic island in the city of London um, where you can't, you know, you can't close a road except for, for 12 hours over one Friday night. Um, there's like 
loads and loads of services going on underneath there. You've got to crane something in that you want it to look impossible, but it can't actually be impossible. Um, so all of those logistics became incredibly difficult to deal with. Um, so we, um, we prefabricated as much as possible um, and then brought it in. This was the night that we were allowed to close one lane because it's all A roads around there. And it was a Friday night um, trying to put things together overnight. Everybody in the city is drunk. Um, they're coming up, I like your crane. Um, so annoying. <laughs> that, that really happened. Um, and, you know, just trying to get this thing together, we, digging out the foundations and so on was really complicated because you get down there and none of the um, surveys companies wanted to take liability for actually doing a drawing because it's like, oh, God, it's the city of London. It's going to be awful. You know, if I cut through one of these things by accident, then like some bank is going to go down and I'm going to get sued and so on. So it was all like a little bit informal um, and we had like the city guys the, the structural engineers sorry um, coming down to the city and um, just literally measuring up is that enough weight to bring it down the guys from the who were building the um, the gherkin foundation no, the cheese grater foundations were going on in, in at the time it's like we just borrow a little bit of your concrete somebody's dug some holes um, it was all fine um, anyway, so there we are going up overnight there, um, and the the pillars finally are decorated with these um, man, uh, illuminated manuscript type patterns, um, and there are all of the different names of the sponsors. It was very much a group effort between so many different people, and there it is, taller than the gherkin. Um, so yeah, that was really hard work, and um, the. This project was actually there to kind of signal that this area is undergoing a lot of change. Um, and this traffic island is not going to exist very soon. So Palace is going to come down um, and hopefully find a new home in the nearby area. So watch this space. There she is from underneath. Flashiest. Whoa, that's flashy. This is our one project in China. <laughs> um, this is made of handbag chains. Um, <laughs> basically, this is part of the ROBA, um, ROBA shop windows uh, project a couple of years ago. And um, we were really, really lucky in that they invited us not to do a shop window, but actually to build a little pavilion. Um, and it was really tricky because we were working um, sort of from um, far away. We had a good um, contractor. We had somebody there that we were working with. Um, but it's, it's essentially, I mean, it's a very silly project, but um, it's essentially a, a framework that then is hanging all of these handbag chains off. And we had the most amazing opening um, ceremony ever um, where they attach loads of fireworks to it and blow it all up. And it was brilliant. Um, so that, that's our flashy project in China. Tastiest. Ah, the scale dinner. <laughs> this isn't really a project, but it is in here because it was funny. <laughs> Basically, Rosie in her office um, insisted, and she kept going on about it, so eventually we all relate, relented, that we would have to have a dinner where everybody gets a course and a scale. So like starter, main meal, dessert, whatever, and then a scale like two to one, one to 30, and so on. And um, do we have all of the things? Well, these ones here, I think that's a three to one starter, so that's um, an ostrich egg being eggs on toast. Um, this is my uh, contribution on the left here, which is 20 to 1 caviar. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> anyway, that's just silly. Um, smallest. This is a project that we're currently about to do, and it's um, the world's smallest nature reserve. Um, <laughs> the, it's, we're talking about the kind of the pavilion up in the top right-hand corner there. Um, it's going to be in Nine Elms. Um, I've never shown it to anybody before, so... Here you go. Um, and we're just creating a raised garden in a, um, in a kind of water tank structure. Um, it's it's going to be raised and it's going to be inaccessible so that really nature is going to take over. And uh, we've got to try and get it some kind of important status as a nature reserve so that it can be world's smallest nature reserve. Tallest. So um, we were asked by... There we go. Um, we were asked by the AJ to... Um, with a bunch of other architects um, to go on a study trip to Istanbul um, and look at kiosks, which are these structures that you find, um, sort of water drinking fountain structures that you find around Istanbul, um, and sort of do a study trip and then conceive of a kiosk structure for London. Um, and while we were there, we were looking at these, these beautiful pavilions that are all sort of 
incredibly intricate, beautifully tiled um, things. But essentially, they were something that was um, given as a, a kind of gift to the city by the Sultan. And they were huge because they were massive water tanks. Um, and so when we were thinking about, OK, how do we translate this and its relevance to London, um, we, were, we sort of thought, well, you've got this kiosk. You take away the Sultan, and you take away the need for a water, water tank because you have running water. And you're basically left with a tap. So what else is important for London in terms of providing water? And of course, free drinking water on the go is still very, very important. Um, we did a lot of research into um, bottled water. And you know, I don't need to tell you that it's um, the sort of environmental impacts of the plastic bottles themselves, but also just importing all of that water all over the place is nonsense. I think we, in the end, we found out that it takes actually three litres of water to make one litre of bottled water. So it's just all kind of nonsense. Um, so having access to drinking water on the go would be brilliant for London. Um, but we've got quite a lot of crap in our um, urban fabric already, lots of different kind of uh, signage and um, post boxes and advertising boards and things like that. So we needed something that would be um, kind of quite slender footed and yet still be present enough that it would give people the confidence, if there was a network of these out there, the confidence to bring their bottled wa bottle of water out and know that they would have places to refill it every day. So we thought we'd better go talk. Um, and we did a whole study into Soho, thinking about what are the most important places, that, um, sort of most visible places that you could put things. Um, and when we presented it, we made sure that we cut the image off at the top before um, the end, so that they could be as, sort of as tall as necessary um, to, in order to make sure that they worked. And um, it was actually quite surprising that um, a couple of people picked up on this project, and I ended up going on Radio 4, which was really cool, even though I had to get up at like half past four in the morning. Um, and then um, yesterday, I actually presented it at a water conference for Water UK, um, who are sort of campaigning for access to, to water. So I think it's, it's become quite an important project for us, even though it was just a sort of silly little study, really. But yeah, it's quite nice. What's our loudest project? Oh, this is another silly one. We were asked by the ICA to do, um, they have these sleepovers, and to do a workshop with some kids. And um, so we worked with my sister, who's a clarinetist on the left there, um, to put on in a building opera. Um, so all of the kids made models of, made costumes for the, of themselves as buildings. Um, and then we put on a building opera. And it was loads of fun and very loud. And then they all had to go to sleep. Scariest project. Oh, monsters. He's pretty scary. Um, I had a dream ages ago that I was wearing swimming goggles and watching a sad film and crying into the goggles. And I told my friend this dream, and he said, and he'd recently tried to make salt from seawater. And he said, oh, if you could wear your swimming goggles, then we could collect the tears and then make salt out of the tears. And we thought that was funny. Um, and then I was talking about this down the pub with someone else um, who runs the um, monster shop in um, Hoxton Street Monster Shop, which is a, a kind of shop for monsters as a front for a writing charity. Um, and she thought that that would be a great shop for a, a great kind of product for a monster clientele. So we had the wonderful pleasure of developing a product for a monster clientele, which is quite rare. <laughs> And um, so we thought that, well, if uh, monsters are going to, um, you know, if monsters are going to have salt and season their um, food with salt from human tears, then maybe this is a safe way for monsters to experience human emotions. Um, so tears of anger would have this smoky flavor, and then the monsters could safely feel human anger. From chopping onions, a little bit simpler, an onion flavor. Tears from sneezing, obviously peppery. Tears from laughter, spicy. Um, and tears from sorrow um, actually have a kind of blue lavender uh, flavor. And we developed this product, um, and um, you can buy it. It's actually really tasty. Um, they're not actually really from human tears, um, unfortunately. That would cause all kinds of health issues. Um, but we worked with um, a salt company in Angus Anglesey who provided the salt for us. And um, it all goes to a brilliant cause um, to do this um, after school um, writing club for kids. Enchanted us, so we're getting really like liberal with the <laughs> words now. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so um, we um, last year there was this competition put out for uh, Hans Christian Andersen um, Museum of Fairy Tales, 
And because we'd been working with sort of silly fairy tale and narrative ideas, we thought we'd, we'd very, very rarely do competitions because it's, it's so time consuming and difficult kind of financially and so on. But we couldn't let this one go. It was just too good of a brief um, to make a, a museum for Hans Christian Andersen. Um, and it was to, designed to be part of the whole city block. Um, and so we designed these nine different pavilions that are all different kinds of um, d different kinds of characters in the, in the streetscape. But um, the key thing is that what you can do in this museum is explore the roots of the buildings as if the buildings were trees, and that you could go under and sort of explore underneath and have these kind of sunken gardens and so on. And I won't go into it loads of detail now. Um, we were one of the ten finalists, and um, they purchased our idea, which is weird. Um, and it was just also a wonderful experiment to try and really look at how you can make something fairy tale, and super cheesy and enjoy it. Jolliest. Um, when we describe this, we call, um, we call the ecology of colour a jolly custodian for Dartford Central Park. Um, because basically at the beginning, when they invited us to do a project there, they had no idea what they wanted to do. They just wanted to make this little um, peninsula, which is trapped between two streams inside the park in Dartford. Um, some kind of use, give it some kind of custodianship. Um, and we threw around a lot of ideas and it actually took quite a long time to agree with the client what the final thing would be. Um, and we thought that it, this could be a great place for a shared resource between all the local primary schools and um, other local groups um, to create a place where they could have um, um, dyeing workshops and um, bird watching workshops and uh, pond dipping and sort of um, nature drawing and sort of things like this that would work in a place that because it had been inaccessible for quite a long time become really overgrown in a lovely way. Um, so here's the site. So uh, fun fact history. Basically the reason that this site exists is because in like 15 something two mill owners had a fight that one of them thought that the other one's water mill was taking all the power out of the river. Um, and that he wasn't going to be able to do as well as the other one. And they, so they agreed to split the river apart so that they could each have their own bit of the river. I mean, it's obviously completely stupid. But anyway, it created this weird slot of land in between um, that then became really difficult to access. So we looked at the different kinds of plants that yield natural dyes as a kind of starting point, and so as the kind of colours that we could perhaps use. And we looked at the processes involved in creating these natural dyes and wanted to both plant a landscape that would allow these workshops to take place there, but also make the architecture a bit of a kind of ode to that, um, to that colourful process. Um, so we worked with um, graphic designers Nuvu to um, create this pattern, Joy, um, which is hand painted on the um, hand painted on all of the cladding by loads of sort of artists and local volunteers. It was just like we hired a um, we hired a community hall nearby the site to get everything ready, um, and then this pattern is completely the king of the design. So you can see in the section here, you can spot a couple of weird like triple beams and things like that. And that was all because everything, okay, yeah, the structure is important, fine. But this was a thing where that pattern is king, that pattern defines everything. And it's a very silly way to design. I wouldn't recommend it, it gives you some headaches, but um, it was quite fun. Um, and here it is all coming together. Um, and there's no uh, plastic or glass in the, in the structure. So if you want light, you need to open things and we've got different kinds of openings so this is the beak on the front which is the huge open we work with a winch company to get that to open like that and these smaller openings on the side tall openings and then at the back there um, on the right hand side there you can see the ones that come in and they create these desk height things you have stools um, so that you can look um, into the um, into the woodland in the back there and this was our first staircase we're very proud of that staircase um, and here are some of the dying workshops going on there it is, being colourful. It's a great place to take pictures of your dog, if, you, if you're looking for that. Yeah. And us. <laughs> okay, and then finally, how am I doing? Oh, I'm a bit short, never mind, eh? Orlias. So this is recently we um, were asked to do a drawing for Maggie Centre to raise money for Maggie Centres. Um, and so um, I just wanted to show you guys this. Um, it's a drawing of all of our projects combined, which is quite fun to do. And there they all are. Any questions? The end? <laughs> no? <laughs> oh, 
That's okay. Cool. <laughs>